The nine months gestation period is usually the happiest in any parent's life. The expectation of 10 beautiful fingers and 10 perfectly shaped toes on delivery day can be dashed away by a complicated delivery, genetic mutation, or the random roulette of bad luck. As limbs get longer, some stay deformed, and a parent's greatest fear becomes their ultimate challenge. Society can be cruel. The stigma, discrimination, lack of information toppled by pure ignorance results in hurtful words and actions. Caring for someone with cerebral palsy is a challenge. Living with cerebral palsy is the penultimate. To be informed, society can do one simple thing. Ask. Don't stare. pretty exciting. It was actually a planned pregnancy, pretty normal pregnancy all the way through though. Last doctor visit, we had just one slight issue. My blood pressure was a bit up and doctor thought it would be best that I be admitted at the hospital and have my baby delivered. Yeah. And what hospital did you choose? Victoria Hospital. After I was admitted, the plan was for the doctor who was doing my case to induce labor. She took a while. It was supposed to have been done almost immediately. She did induce labor for me about 12 days after I was admitted after, at the hospital. When she induced labor, I went into labor. A few hours later, labor stopped. From my readings and what I knew, I was supposed to be reinduced almost immediately or within 12 hours. However, she would reinduce labor for me 36 hours later. During natural labor, the cervix, the lower part of the uterus, softens. This process is called ripening. Next, the cervix thins out or dilates. Usually, the cervix must be fully dilated for a baby's head to come through. To induce labor, this process is speeded along in one of the following ways. A doctor may insert a finger to separate the membranes that connect your amniotic sac to the cervix. Following this procedure, the body releases prostaglandin hormones, which can lead to the start of contractions. The cervix can also be ripened by a balloon-like device, which is inserted into the vagina, and then filled with water. This causes the cervix to expand. And that's what it's supposed to be about, having labor pains to bring your baby into the world. But an hour and a half into my labor, my water broke. The water was blackish, which told us that baby already had a bowel movement and was in distress. Doctor knew of the situation, nurses knew of the situation. At that point, I did ask to have a C-section because I knew my baby was in distress. I did not know how long labor was going to last. I was advised against the C-section by my medical practitioners who were in the room with me. They told me they would simply put a baby monitor on to monitor the baby's fetal heart rate and what was going on inside. Looking at the monitor, I realized off and on the heartbeat would be off. I was told not to worry about it. It was a problem with the monitor itself. <laughs> I know. <laughs> not a problem with baby, but a problem with, with monitor. the monitor. So why would the hospital have a faulty monitor? A faulty monitor. So how would Such I know when stage? something actually did go wrong? And we already knew that something was wrong because baby, we knew that the baby was in distress just based on the color of the, wa of the water when my water broke. When he was born, there was no crying, nothing. The cord was wrapped around his neck. He was actually born 
flat, or in layman's term, he was born dead. That's when Flutter became, there was Flutter about the room. Nurses would take him, run away with him, not saying anything. I had to wait at least an hour before I hear anything back from them. You're laying there on the bed. What's going through your mind? That baby's dead. For nine months, you've waited for that moment. What are the questions that you're asking? Who are you asking, to? At that point in time, there's no one to ask anything because I'm on the bed alone and the nurses have taken off with the baby and trying to do their thing. So there's really nobody to ask anything. On January 15, 2010, Lanfrey's Sherubin was born flat. He was resuscitated after five minutes. He weighed in at six pounds, nine ounces. But later that day, he would begin having seizures. And the doctor would explain to me that because of what happened at his birth and the seizures that they did not expect him to live past 48 hours. Tell me the point where you went into the nursery and you saw him for the first time. When I went in there and I saw him for the first time, he looked okay to me. He was just there lying in the incubator. He only had one set of tubing in his mouth and I was told it was to suck out the whatever he may have inhaled or ingested. When you have that first discussion with the nurses and your doctor, what is that like? Actually, I never got to speak to the doctor after that. The doctor who delivered you? No, I never got to speak to her after that. How come? Why not? I don't know. She never explained to you? Nothing. Was it a case where you were being asked to push and you didn't? No, none of that. From what I was told, what actually caused everything to happen was the fact that I was, ingest, I was induced, that I went into labor, it stopped, and she re-induced me 36 hours later. Why did it take so long? That I do not know. St. Lucia's infant mortality rate is 12 to every 1,000 live births. The clock was winding down quickly on Lanfrey Sherbin's life. And that's because when we were told that he would not make it past 48 hours, my family and I took the decision to have him baptized. We're Catholic and we believe in baptizing our babies. As a mother, how do you go from one woman being pregnant, giving birth to your first child, and baptizing him and preparing him for death, all in the same span. At the back of my mind, the possibility that I may be burying my newborn is very much alive. But the priest who's there to do the baptism is also giving hope. Because at that point in time, he's telling me, that little boy is not going to die. Because through baptism, he's going to be given new life and you will walk out of that hospital with him in your arms. The seizures stopped the day he was baptized and he was discharged from the hospital 17 days after. But Lanfrey's was not out of the woods yet. When he began not meeting some of his milestones, his developmental milestones, that's when we realized that something was a little off. Normally at six weeks, you would have experienced your baby's first smile and whatnot. And we would be getting that first smile around 10, 11 weeks late. So he would actually smile for the first time at 10 weeks. So then we realized that all was not well. But we never went back to VH with him. Then we went to Dr. Bird, who's actually a developmental pediatrician. We took him to Dr. Bird, and that's when she began explaining to us what the possibilities for him. Lanfrey's was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Bye. Okay, my boy. What? Cerebral palsy is an umbrella or catch-all phrase for a group of palsies, which are motor or movement disorders. Uh, probably the most visible, and perhaps not the most common, but the most visible type of childhood disability. And it's actually a group, each one different, each child is unique, of movement disorders control of movement, initiation of movement, uh, because of a problem with the brain. In the past, most doctors thought that cerebral palsy was brain damage okay. to a baby during the birthing process only. We now recognize that whereas the majority of children uh, do experience a challenge during birth, which results in damage to the brain, causing cerebral palsy. Uh, it is not only that it's, it doesn't end there. There are some children that are actually born with some sort of genetic or other defect causing a malformation of their brain that selects them for trouble during what should be a normal birthing process. And you can understand the difference in those two scenarios especially when it comes to litigation for malpractice. Well, up to this day, he has not achieved most of his milestones. So, no crawling, no walking, even sitting he needs help with. What are the two most challenging things dealing with a child with CP? One, cost, finances. They don't eat what our quote-unquote normal children eat. For my son in particular, he wants everything mashed or blended, and there are things that he just will not eat. Secondly, just thinking about his future. What's going to happen to him? You're pregnant again? Yes, I am. Where may I pregnant, Zala? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I told myself that this pregnancy is more for him than for me. Because I look at my life and I say to myself, the people in our lives who are there for us the most when we need them are our siblings who grew up with us, sharing our homes, sharing our households, sharing our experiences. And I believe he needs that. He needs somebody growing up in his home with him who will know him, understand him, sharing his home, sharing his experiences. Somebody who's going to be there for him because I'm not going to live forever. Emma's story is laden with suspicion of malpractice and hers is a colossal burden to carry. But it is yes. not the heaviest. Coming up, we meet 25-year-old Cornel Monrose and a mother trapped in babysitter mode. And later, not one but two children with cerebral palsy. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo, and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. From marketing concepts, surveys and research, to professionally produced ads for social media and television, and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology, and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now and beyond.
For over 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid, and reliable. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all-glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454 6538. Cerebral palsy affects people in different ways because different parts of the brain can be injured. However, it always has some impact on the person's movements, and this is because the messages coming from the brain to the muscles are affected. Where the whole body is affected, both arms and legs and the trunk, this is called quadriplegia. Where both legs are mainly affected, this is called diplegia. People with diplegia often also have difficulty with fine movement of the hands. When one side of the body is affected, for example, the left arm and the left leg, this is called hemiplegia. Spasticity is usually caused by damage to nerve pathways within the brain or spinal cord that control muscle movement. Spasticity is present in about 86% of people with cerebral palsy. One of the less common forms of cerebral palsy is ataxia. Ataxia means without order or in coordination. Nearly half of the children who do develop cerebral palsy were born premature. I had a good pregnancy up to six, almost seven months. The morning I was getting dressed to go to work. I realized I was bleeding. I went to the doctor's office. I stayed there until four o'clock. And then he sent me to VHE, he told me that the baby is dead. So to go at the hospital so they can move the baby. Being at the hospital, the nurse did check the baby. She told me the baby is still alive. It did like maybe half an hour, an hour waiting. She never came. Then I called another nurse because I realized I was bleeding so, so much. The whole bed was covered with blood. So I called another nurse. She came to me and she was like, oh. And she told me she's going for a wheelchair. She went for a wheelchair. She, and by the time I reached, inside she told me push and that was it and the baby came out but when the baby came out the baby wasn't breathing it will be 24 hours before sandra will see her grossly underweight baby who was delivered three months premature honestly when i saw him i was like i didn't know he was so tiny i just wasn't expecting him to be so And from the time I saw him, I started crying. Did the doctors explain to you at that point the possibility of further complications because of premature birth? No, nobody told me anything. Before I gave birth, I wasn't thinking of disability. I wasn't thinking of anything so. Honestly, nothing. When I had him the day I delivered him, I still wasn't thinking about anything so. When he weighed about two, three ounces, three, three pounds, the, the discharges went home. Three pounds? Three pounds. He weighed two, two pounds, 14 ounces when he was born. The early warning signs of CP include low muscle tone, the child may feel floppy when picked up, muscle spasms or stiffness, poor muscle control, reflexes and posture, and in many cases, the baby can't sit up independently or roll over by six months. When I realized about eight, nine months, he's not doing anything, nothing. I took him to Dr. Siemens, and that was the time he didn't tell me anything to. He sent me to the Donata school. Honestly, from the time I heard Donata, 
you know what comes to mind. Now, there are developmental milestones at three months, at six, nine, a year, and so forth. Which of the milestones did Cornell reach in terms of a smile, um, sitting up, and what, what was the one thing or series of things that made you realize that something was wrong? Well, Cornell was smiling as any normal baby would smile and he wasn't sitting up he never sits up and he his arms were was always straight his feet was kind of bent like you know so he, um yeah at that time i i you know felt a little something maybe wrong at that time i didn't accept him yet i didn't accept it yet but along the line i got to accept him you know I used to cry a lot. I used to cry like every day. But when I accepted Cornell, I told God, you gave him to me. And no matter what, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to take care of my son and that's it. Did you ever think of putting him up for adoption? Never. I never, never thought of that. And I would never give my child up. Never. No matter what, I will never give him up. The way society treated us, to me, it was not fair. Um, I remember certain people that was not speaking to me. They used to call him names, you know. When I walk in down the road, they would dance and throw remarks. There was one particular person I had to send a lawyer's letter to her because she used to embarrass me everywhere, in town or anywhere, and tell me, oh, tepti malaba, we did the boot, and so on, you know, because, you know, they kind of stop, like, right? What assistance have you gotten thus far from the government or any other institutions? I've never got any assistance from government or anyone. Everyone needs a little time away. Alone time to unwind, relax and recharge from the daily routine. Time away gives a caregiver the opportunity to focus on their needs, spend time with other children or perhaps pursue an interest that brings them pleasure. However the time is spent, it makes for a rejuvenated caregiver. Often, parents who care for a child with special needs don't have the resources to take the time off. Though they know they need the time away, the difficulty is either finding confidence in another person's ability to properly care for their child's special condition or being able to afford aided care. In St. Lucia, there is no dedicated service which can assist such parents. I would wish my sister would tell me, hey Sandra, let me come and keep Cornell for you for the day and go to town, go and enjoy yourself, just go lie me and so I would love to hear, you know, my sisters, one of my sisters tell me that. Imagine when my family have functions, I don't really go, you know. I don't really go to their functions. I cannot stay home. They do not know how I feel inside. But honestly, I really, really, really feeling bad about it that no one coming to my rescue, no one coming to me, no one asking me how am I feeling, how, how it is with Cornell or anything, nothing on either side, you know. When we return, the lady with the golden hands. And later, we meet the woman from Denry with the impossible task. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. 
And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. In an effort to ensure patient and first responder safety, the St. Lucia Fire Service has reviewed its patient transfer procedures, especially for patients with respiratory distress. Face masks will be provided. At no time during transportation should the face mask be removed. Please be patient and cooperative during this time to ensure you receive the best possible care while keeping our first responders safe. Life is a series of triumphs and trials. The circle of life has all the usual certainties and of course the unpredictable. Just one can affect you and your loved ones. Sadly, many fail to prepare for the unforeseen. Thankfully, we've been here for over 138 years, helping you plan and recover. We offer peace of mind at that critical moment. GTM Insurance, sound, solid and reliable. Call us today at 458-6300 or log on to gtminsurance.net. Traditionally, a special needs child was deemed as mean-spirited or the result of a family curse and was confined to the blind spots of society. Early intervention programs were virtually non-existent. Today, thanks to a group of dedicated St. Lucians, the Child Development and Guidance Center is now a reality with a formidable mandate. The Child Development and Guidance Centre is a non-profit organisation, a medical facility that's responsible for the early identification of children with developmental issues and providing therapeutic in intervention for them so that they reach their maximum potential. I would be one of the first people that a child with cerebral palsy would meet. Um, we've actually set up um, a liaison with the hospital, with Victoria Hospital. So I go into the hospital once a week to the neonatal, once a month, sorry, to the neonatal unit and make contact with the doctors, the nurses, parents if I can, to identify those children who are born premature or have difficulties at birth, maybe have seizures. Um, and we try to get them referred to Child Development and Guidance Centre as early as possible. It can be a logistical nightmare yeah. to get children who live outside the Castries Basin to the CDGC on a regular <laughs> basis. With collaboration came a satellite center in the Mabuya Valley, which serves 24 children with special needs. That came about again because of the close collaboration between the Community Child Health Service and the private NGO. Child Development and Guidance Centre that together recognised that we just did not have enough in place for children, especially those outside the Castries Basin, who had severe multiple disabilities, most of them cerebral palsy. And we actually came together as a volunteer group of interested professionals and formed, well, you can call it a national network of persons working for the care of multiple disabled children, and decided that Hell no, this can't happen. We have got to do something. And we commanded an unused space in the Denry Valley that perhaps I think it belongs to care. And Dr. Carleen Mason is a like-minded individual and said, of course, go ahead and use it. And we got a parent of a child with physical challenges to volunteer to come and sit with children with multiple disabilities whose parents needed some sort of respite from the care of their children. And that's how that center started. If you have the hand. 
Pitalin Polidor of Bypass Denry is a mother thankful for the services provided at this center. Her complications began in 2004 with her first pregnancy. She carried her son to full term. However, he was delivered grossly underweight. To further complicate this prognosis, by six weeks, he became afflicted with a series of seizures. So I'm ten for the day. Ten seizures? For the day, yeah. It's uncontrollable. What do you do when that happens? Well, I know how to turn them on the side and leave them there until the seizure stops. That's all I have to do. Or there are times I used to rush to the hospital with him, but now that I know how to handle it, I just allow him to have a seizure and leave him alone. Between six weeks mm. and one year, you're a new mother. Mm. What was that like, dealing with a child with so many seizures per day? It was hard. I must say. It was hard. Tears every day, crying, crying, crying to my child. It was very difficult. What was the help like from your relatives? What were the neighbors saying? That sort of thing. They were saying a lot. They were joking me. I couldn't go out. I would not get jokes and stuff. My mother helped a lot. How I did must the say. Give you jokes? Yeah, I would go to a karaoke and they'll call Mumu and these things. Everywhere I go, I used to get these kind of things. They say it's a genetic problem because he did a CAT scan at um, Tapio. Do you have any other people in your family with a history of seizures? Yes, my brother, my father, has seizures. At a year and a half, mm -hmm. you're a new mother. What are your expectations? He'll not be a normal child. Mm -hmm. you know? That's what I expected. Did you ever think of giving him for adoption? Nope. Never an option. Mm -hmm. What is he doing that's like a normal child? Nothing. And how does that change your life? It did change my life, I must say. Now I'm a better person. I have more patience now, so mm. it did change my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get pregnant the second time. Yeah. And what were the what were the fears? I fear she was going to be just like him. Even Doctor Bird saw it. She told me, "You have a baby, and then you're going for another one." Everybody saw the fear. And for you, were you afraid? Yeah, I was afraid. Yeah, I was afraid. I must say, but. It happened already, so I just had to accept it. Was there any time when you considered having an abortion? No. I thought she would be an emergency, mm. so I didn't think of abortion. When did you first see signs? Well, from the time she was at the nursery for two weeks, and Dr. Plummer asked me to come back to the hospital. But I said, since I'm already dealing with Dr. Simmons, why not continue Dr. Simmons? And then when I took her to Dr. Simmons, he told me that mm. she's, she, born, she, she was born with a small head, and so I have to expect seizures and these things. Because while the brain is growing, it's resting against the skull, so it will cause seizures. Mm. Because at eight months, no, it was seven months, she stopped growing inside of me. Dr. Linda told me the baby's not growing. Something has to be wrong. So I said, no, maybe as I stress in and stuff, he tell me, no, the baby's not growing inside of you. So he tell me, well, let's leave it for eight months to see what's, what development and still no, no growth. So. I still, I had a mind something was wrong. I had a mind, so I was expecting, I was expecting something. And you returned to Denry with another baby. Yeah. Who has cerebral palsy. We'll see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that's It was hard, it was tough. It was a challenge because I already have one decisions and then I have to do it for another one decisions. It's like, wait, how will I sleep at night? This and that. And it was hard because sometimes I have to, I was hospitalized before and then he home with my mother 
And I have to be thinking, what am what I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It was very hard. But I went through it all. And your neighbors were already mm. giving you pressure. What happened? They are afraid of them. I can tell mm. you that. The least they can do is like come and cast an eye if I have to go somewhere. They will come, cast an eye on them, and go back, but they will not touch. They are afraid of the chair. What do you but mean they are afraid of them? They are afraid to touch them. I don't know if it's because of the seizures they have in. I don't know. Everywhere I go, people and run. <laughs> they just run. There's a time a child was there and the child ran. I had to tell her, no, don't run. She, you don't do anything. Don't run. <laughs> Because of the severity of her children's CP, Pitalin is unable to work, providing for herself and a 12-year-old and 10-year-old with special needs is difficult at best. She receives $400 per month from the disability grant provided by the Ministry of Social Transformation. Yeah, it's very expensive. Medication and they're taking the same medication, but Dr. Bird doesn't want me to be taken from the same bottle. So I have to be buying one bottle for her, one for him, and the medication is expensive. Does she walk? No. She's the same as him. But she will know. She will know you're around. She, she can hear you. Like, if you're talking to her, she'll turn and watch you. If she wants something, she will only tell her you want that. She'll give you a hard stay, so you know, yes, that's what she wants. But if she doesn't want it, she'll turn away, or she'll bring her eyes down. That means no. Does she communicate any other way? No. She'll only laugh when you're doing them. What's going on? She laughs. Yeah. <laughs> She'll only laugh for you. That's all. Um, and how about him? He laughs. He's a weather channel around because he only is like one eye, he doesn't really see. Like it's like a blurry vision for him in one eye. But he knows how to go around. <laughs> Where do you see these children 10 years from now? I don't even know. That's the way I don't know. I hope they stay alive for 10 years. But, like, I don't know. They say the third time's a charm. And Pitalin swallowed a dose of faith and got pregnant once again. Her delivery day was plagued with hopes, fears, seizures, and excitement. As soon as the nurse put him on me to go into the room, I started praying. I said, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the child. But I still had the back of my mind saying, take care, you have a seizure. Take care, you have a seizure. And I said, and then it's when the doctor passed. Dr. Jerome passed, and Dr. Jerome checked him out. He told me, he me, your baby is fine. You're going home. I cried that day. <laughs> I see that no more chat. Coming up, stuffed yeah, toy yeah, therapy yeah. and massaging yeah. limbs to life, and later, the mature, well educated yeah. face of cerebral palsy. what I'm here for. For over 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid, and reliable. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo, and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. 
from marketing concepts, surveys and research to professionally produce ads for social media and television and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now, and beyond. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. With all that's happening around us, simple adjustments are necessary to keep us all safe. When calling 911, we may need a little more information to deploy the right personnel and protocols. You may be asked about your travel history, signs and symptoms, contact and movement history, and whether others in your household are exhibiting similar symptoms. Please, be patient and cooperative during this time to ensure you receive the best possible care while keeping our first responders safe. Once upon a time, thousands of years ago, treating cerebral palsy is China, almost uh, as complex as the condition itself. And there is no cookie cutter approach because each individual is affected differently. Although the brain injury that causes cerebral palsy cannot be healed, the resulting physical impairment can be managed with a wide range of treatments and therapies. Early intervention programs are for infants or young children with cerebral palsy or those considered to be at risk. These programs aim to improve the gross motor and fine motor skills of infants and young children, that is, their ability to roll over, sit independently, stand, walk, and use their hands for play or learning. The overriding treatment goal for those with cerebral palsy is to optimize mobility, manage primary conditions, control pain, prevent and manage complications associated conditions and co-mitigating factors, maximize independence, enhance social and peer interactions, foster self-care, optimize ability to communicate, maximize learning potential, and provide quality of life. Once a week, Caitlin and Kivon have an opportunity to go to school. They undergo therapy and interact with special education trainers. Transportation is provided by the Ministry of Health. We do not have enough space for our children. Um, we are being run as an, an added program to send the Blind Welfare Association so financially. A lot of the things that we would like to do and we want to do, we can't get done. So we have to do our own fund the sourcing for cleaning our yards and getting stuff. We do get some supplies from St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. They are responsible for paying our teachers' aids and our rent. Um, but other things, the, all the extras needed, we source them ourselves. We, we get our Do you that there is no direct intervention from the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education? Uh -huh. 
Ministry of Health provides transport for our wheelchair-bound children on Wednesdays and on Fridays. That's about all we get from the Ministry of Health. And what about on Mondays and Tuesdays? And well, and that's the thing about the program. Our children, our children with our CP children, our more involved CP children only come to school on Mondays and Fridays when we have the bus. We can't have them any other days. And not just because of that, we don't have the space. We can't keep, have both. We serve 24 children. Our space is very small. We can't have 24 children in here at the same time. Oh, Kate's lady is a feisty little girl. That's all I could, she's, yes, she has a mind of her own. She decides on what she wants to do and what she doesn't want to do. I am happy that I'm the adult and she's the child so I can make her do it. <laughs> yes, because she said no, she didn't want to work today. She's very forceful about saying what she wants and what she doesn't want. As much as possible, depending on what it is, I do respect. I do respect her choices. CP can be um, described in seven ways. Okay, so, but in two main ways. You can decide as um, the muscles, so whether you, you could decide to describe a child as being spastic, so the child is rigid and firm, and, or a child can be floppy. Caitlin is a mixture of floppy and spastic. Then we describe CP as what regions are involved, where it is hemi, whether it's half of the body or the um, quadri, all your four limbs. Um, so she's quadri, all her four limbs are, uh, are involved, and she's mixed. And some of the positions and some of the movements are not things that the parents can't learn to do. And when they come to the center, we do that. We tell you, this is what I want you to do, this is how you can do it. Sometimes, like on Fridays, when the parents come in, we show them what we want them to do so they can go home and do it till we see the child again on Wednesday. In the mid-1800s, Dr. William John Little pioneered the study of cerebral palsy using his own childhood disability as an inspiration. His innovative techniques are still helping people today. So William Osler, who was instrumental in furthering modern medicine, wrote the book on cerebral palsy. Dr. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, proposed the idea that cerebral palsy might result from abnormal fetal development, decades before the medical field embraced the concept. Here are a few famous people with CP. Josh Blue is an American stand-up comedian who is most famous for winning season four of the reality show Last Comic Standing in 2006. He uses his self deprecating sense of humor, challenging others to overcome preconceived notions about those with cerebral palsy. So what inspired you to do stand-up of all things? What am I going to do? Be a traffic cop? <laughs> Blue said the purpose of his appearance on the show was to make people aware of the fact that people with disabilities can make an impact. Uh, people ask me if I get nervous before coming up on stage. I said, heck no, I got this many people staring at me all day. <laughs> I was walking downtown and the drunk tank stopped and picked me up. I was like, uh-oh. I was like, wait a minute here, fellas, there's a misunderstanding. I'm, I'm not drunk, I have cerebral palsy. They were like, that's a pretty big word for a drunk ass. <laughs> Accomplishment begins with two words, I'll try. Diagnosed with CP at age two, Abby Nicole Curran made history when she became the first Miss USA contestant with a disability in 2008. She founded the Miss You Can Do It pageant for girls with special needs. Christy Brown was an Irish painter, poet and author born with a severe case of CP. For years, he was incapable of any movement or speech until he gained control of his left foot. With the help of his mother, he learned to speak, read, and write. He is most famous for his autobiography, My Left Foot, and being portrayed by Daniel Day-Lewis in a movie of the same title. With independence. Okay. The frequency of cerebral palsy is about two per thousand live births. The incidence are higher in males than females. The St. Lucia Cerebral Palsy Association was formed in 2012. Its mission is to support people directly and indirectly affected with the condition. 
its mandate is to advocate for continuous availability of occupational, speech and physiotherapy. It strives to ensure that affected people have access to suitable education and health care. Nye Constantine is a member with challenges associated with CP, but his is a powerful voice in advocating for acceptance and social inclusion. Human beings have the need of belonging, but that way, cerebral policy does not keep does not prevent our document is the attitude of others that make this one difficult. In St. Lucia, we need not just an adjustment, but a total reinvention of our attitude towards people with differences. Our kids are not retarded, like some people like to think, just because a child can't walk, that eh, eh, that child is mentally retarded. They're not. They don't have any kind of issues with OBA. Nobody has done that to them. I do understand the tendencies. If we see something different, we stay and we judge. We decide on our own how things are and what they are supposed to be. Ask. Don't say anything bad. Stop pointing fingers at them. They are human beings just like all of us. It's just that. The different. The way they're looking at you, it's like you feeling so bad, like you should have stayed home, don't go anywhere. It's better to ask a question instead of just staying, making a feeling uncomfortable. Put yourself in the place of the parent wheeling the disabled spastic child and don't stare. Ask. Oh